And one of them was St. Therese. And she dedicated her life basically to love. So she said that St. John of the Cross, so she was a Carmelite, she read John of the Cross. She said she discovered in him the true saint of love. And the church recognizes her as a true saint of love also. So in a retreat six years before she died, a Franciscan retreat master had, as she said, launched on her waves of confidence and love. She had, she had previously been afraid to venture into those areas, but this retreat master set her forth, I hope that I can do the same sort of thing for you, to identify the particular virtue, particular fruit of the spirit to focus on. So it turns out that love was such a significant thing in her life that when she died on September 30th, 1897, at the age of 24, her final words were, Oh my God, I love you. What a wonderful ending. So a year after she died, the community, this was a tradition of the Carmelites. They wrote a story of, she had written a story of a soul at the order of her superior, who happened to be her sister, her blood sister. And that story of a soul became very, very popular. This led to her beatification, and then she was canonized and declared a saint, and Pope St. John Paul II in 1997 declared her a doctor of the church. Docere in Latin means to teach. So that story of a soul became an example of how to live a good and holy life. Okay, the next one is pretty easy to find a Benedictine connection because she was a Benedictine. So this was Blessed Maria Fortunata Viti. And not only was she a Benedictine, she was a Benedictine with a Mount Angel connection. So she lived in Italy. She died in 1922. She had no formal education. She was illiterate her entire life but she was known to be a very joyful person. So that's why I chose her as an example of living the virtue of joy. So she entered her Benedictine life as a lay sister, and she did tasks of sewing and mending and washing, and she was known for her piety and her closeness to God. So at her death, a number of miracles were noted, and the ch church Authorities started to take notice of this and inquired of it and discovered that she was a truly holy person. As I mentioned yesterday, Father Thomas Brockhaus, who is a canon lawyer, a nationally recognized canon lawyer, he was asked to be the vice postulator for her cause. So we would promote her cause in the Mount Angel Letter, which we used to publish, a national weekly Catholic newspaper. So it turns out, Father Thomas died about 20 years ago, and as I mentioned, he got to be at her beatification, 1967, and so it developed a, a relationship between their community in Verily, south of Rome, and Mount Angel. Well, Father Odo has been asked to take over promoting the cause for, Abbot, uh, for Blessed Fortunata Viti to be to be declared a saint. So that cause is still moving forward at Mount Angel Abbey. So this woman who was very much dedicated to living in joy, even though, like I said, she was illiterate, she still focused on what really matters. Okay, the next one, so for the, uh, the virtue of peace, note that the first thing that was said this morning by the oblates who made their oblation, the first word they stated was, Peace. There we go. So we picked up on that. That's very significant for Benedictines. So I looked in, oh my goodness, in Benedictines, how to focus on peace. Well, here we go. I found there is a video course produced by the Belmont Abbey in, near Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a Benedictine Abbey. And the video course is called The Benedictine Hallmarks, A Pathway to Peace. So how, how to gain peace. And so in for those who watch this course, it gives it from a Benedictine perspective, how to overcome negative thoughts and habits, to find assurance in living one's life's purpose, to practice stability through life's changes, what to do when prayer becomes difficult, how to recognize the gifts God has given you, why hospitality is an opportunity to be more like Christ, which we try to emphasize here, certainly in the guest house, 
and then simple ways to incorporate into your faith, your faith into daily life. So a pathway to peace, a key indication that one is following a Benedictine path is one lives and shares peace. Moving on to patience. As I mentioned yesterday, an example of patience that I put was, that I chose was St. Maximilian Kolbe, who we know was, um, was declared, he was sentenced to, to, to Auschwitz, right, death camp in, in Poland. The key thing here is that he truly was a model of peace. So in Rule of St. Benedict, chapter 4, the Tools for Good Works, it says, do not act in anger. And when I read uh, a couple of years ago, I, did a bi- I read a biography of his, which is actually written by a woman in Portland. She'd studied people who knew him and wrote a book based on that. And his secretary said he never saw him act in anger. So he was a man very blessed with peace. And he wrote a basic practical steps for being able to live in, in patience. So he says, number one, don't say or do anything when you are so hot and bothered, mad and angry. Two, calm yourself down. Three, pray to the Holy Spirit for wisdom. Four, ask God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And five, talk to the person in trying to resolve the situation. So Maximilian Kolbe is a model of living in patience. Okay, for kindness, the kindness model that I chose was Mother Teresa. A couple of quotes by her. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. Another quote. Let us more and more insist on raising funds of love, of kindness, of understanding of peace. Money will come if we seek first the kingdom of God. The rest will be given. And she, another quote from her. Let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness. Kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile. Certainly an exemplar of, of, um, of kindness. So then in the Tools for Good Works, in chapter 4 of the Rule of St. Benedict, it says, relieve the lot of the poor, visit the sick. Your way way of acting should be different than the world's way. And kindness is one of the ways that we get there. So one of the things I like to point out when I talk about Mother Teresa is she and John Paul II had one of the great male-female relationships in church history, right? So Francis and Claire, right? And the, at that level, they, they really, so, but her kindness, her kindness spoke volumes. People knew her for being very kind, even in very challenging situations. She was a person of great, great kindness. Okay, then for generosity, I mentioned yesterday, I chose St. Vincent de Paul. Vincent de Paul, so this is from a a talk that Pope Francis gave on him, said St. Vincent de Paul lived open to the search for God. He had an intensely illuminating encounter with Jesus, the good shepherd, in the poor. And that was where he really emphasized his generosity, being generous to the poor. So that French saint, Vincent de Paul, was certain that Jesus and the poor are the treasure of the church. This is what Pope Francis said about Vincent de Paul. So Vincent de Paul says, moves us to give space and time to the poor. Remember from Rule of St. Benedict, relieve the lot of the poor. So in the image of Jesus, who is poor, it is necessary to become rocks, solid points of support, bringing the spirit of the Lord to the peripheries. That's very much a focus of Pope Francis. So when, he, when Pope Francis gave this general audience, he prayed that the intercession of St. Vincent de Paul would help, to, help people to face the disappointments of life 
and sow the seed of hope in their lives. So St. Vincent de Paul as a model of generosity. Okay, and now I'd like to focus on the issue of unfaithfulness. And for this one, as I mentioned yesterday, chose Mary uh, St. Faustina Kowalska, who died in 1938. So she, she's a very interesting saint to me. She only had three years of education. And yet later in her life, after she had numerous experiences of speaking with Jesus, she wrote a six 100-page book. She got somebody to help her, but she imagined that, a third-grade education, and she wrote a 600-page book. That's an example of faithfulness right there. She was faithful to staying with it. Okay, so at the age of seven, she had some indication of a religious vocation. This would be similar to becoming an oblate. You have some indication that the Lord is calling you to serve in this particular way. So then, in um, 1925, as I recall, she was at a dance, and Jesus had given her indications that he was calling her to something special. And he appeared to her in a vision and basically said, how long are you going to make me wait? And she realized it was time to act. Okay, so she joined the congregation of Our Lady of Mercy in Poland, And she lived there for 13 years and moved in several houses. What's most interesting about her is virtually no one in the community knew that she had communications with Jesus. She was a cook. She worked in the garden. She lived a very simple and uh, unencumbered life. People wouldn't see her as being anything special. But, so the uh, life's story that I found her. This is actually from the Vatican. The Vatican wrote a brief biography of St. Faustina. It said, externally, nothing revealed her rich, mystical interior life. She zealously performed her tests and faithfully observed the rule of religious life, a model of faithfulness. The Vatican biography continues. Faustina was a faithful daughter of the church, which she loved like a mother and a mystic body of Jesus Christ. Conscious of her role in the church, she cooperated with God's mercy in the task of saving souls. Remember that Jesus had asked her to be his apostle of divine mercy, which is kind of amazing that a person with a third grade education living a simple life in a monastery, but Jesus has his own way of working and he was very effective. It it turns out Part of the reason that that she was able to become the the apostle of divine mercy is a certain Polish bishop, archbishop, became pope. He knew of her story, and John Paul took it to Rome, and he promoted it. So that, I'll, I'll give a very clear example of how significant the church finds her in just a minute. So in her diary, she wrote that... Uh, My sanctity and perfection will consist in the close union of my will with the will of God, which we're all called to do. So, Sister Mary Faustina Kowalska reminds us of three key tasks. Reminding the world of the truth of our faith revealed in the Holy Scripture about the merciful love of God toward every human being. Then, entreating God's mercy for the whole world and particularly for sinners, among others, through the practice of new forms of devotion to the divine mercy presented by the Lord, Lord Jesus. I take it if you've traveled around, one of the most common symbols to be found in Catholic churches is a divine mercy image of Jesus standing there with the the red and white coming out from his heart and basically encircling the globe, right? So this is, uh, so that image of divine mercy. It it appeared to her, and she had an artist paint it up. And so that divine mercy image has become very common in Catholic churches. And then the third task in St. Faustina's mission consists in initiating the apostolic movement of the divine mercy. 
Like I said, it certainly, it helped, well, it was essential in that a Polish Pope was elected and promoted that devotion. So in the Vatican's biography of her wrote that the precepts in question require the faithful to display an attitude of childlike trust in God, which expresses itself in fulfilling his will as well as in the attitude of mercy towards one, one's neighbors. Today, this movement within the church involves millions of people throughout the world. She was beatified in 1993 by John Paul II. And then here's a very significant fact, not known by many as far as I can tell. She was canonized. She was declared a saint on April 30th in the year 2000. She was the first saint declared in the third millennium which was the church's way of saying that the third millennium is devoted to the mercy of God. The mercy of God is the fullness of God's love. Right? So St. Faustina Kowalska, this, this uh, humble and, in her day, very little known Polish person, becomes this proponent of God's divine mercy. So then the Benedictine connection that I draw from this, again, is from the Rule of St. Benedict, chapter 4, in the conclusion. Never lose hope in God's mercy. So St. Benedict has 73 statements that he calls us to, to do for the tools of good works. And the last one is, never lose hope in God's mercy. So mercy is a, is a key element of Benedictine life and of Christian life. Okay, the eighth fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. As I mentioned yesterday, I chose for this example, St. Francis. Well, as I looked online, I found a book called St. Francis of Assisi, Gentle Revolutionary. It's, it's a book written for children. So that Francis of Assisi, in his younger years, had a life of fancy clothes, parties, and good times. His father was a wealthy cloth merchant in Assisi. And so this story in this book, and is told many times, of his quest of finding what God was calling him to do. He met a leper and reached out to the leper, and God touched his heart. And that moved him from living a life of luxury and a, a, a wealthy child to wanting to become a very poor person. And in so doing, he lived a life of gentleness. So his, he developed an order, the Franciscan order, in which the brothers' lives are simple and meek and joyful. That's, that's key elements of Franciscan life. And so he had a number of interesting experiences of uh, small miracles that happened around him, like birds flocking to him, a wolf obeying him. And in, an in, in a crib, he saw the infant Jesus smiling at him. He had numerous examples of that. And of course, in this children's book, those are very good things to tell the children, very inspiring for them. And so that Francis's journey Toward the end of his life, he, of course, he was the first saint we can identify who had the stigmata. So those are the wounds of Christ on the hands, the side, and the feet. So St. Francis had that, and a number, of, a number of saints have had that since that time. But Francis is the first one we can identify. And so what's a Benedictine connection with St. Francis? Well, you might have heard this. There was a church in near Assisi owned by the nearby Benedictine Abbey. And they gave it to St. Francis to help start his order. And St. Francis had a dream in which he heard the Lord say to him, rebuild my church. And he was thinking, oh, that little chapel, right? That it was kind of falling apart and he's going to go rebuild that church. And he realized that's not what the Lord was saying to him. He was saying, rebuild my church, means the church in the world. But what an honor that it is a Benedictine chapel that was given to the Franciscans to symbolize that rebuilding the church. That chapel is now encased in a larger church, right? So that's, a, that's a very significant chapel, but it was given by the Benedictines. And every year, 
the, Benedic the Franciscans give the Benedictines a gift and the Benedictines give the Franciscans a gift in Assisi because of that. So that, that's ever since the life of, ever since St. Francis' life that's been happening. So the Benedictines have helped to get the Franciscans going. Okay, last fruit of the Spirit, and then self-control. And that one, I, as I mentioned yesterday, I chose for this uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. So as I mentioned yesterday also, a Benedictine connection is his family, quite wealthy, living near Monte Cassino, wanted him to become the abbot. Basically, they wanted to buy the abbot's office for their son. And um, it turns out, as I mentioned, he sensed a calling to become a Dominican. And he became a key Dominican. I mean, his, his uh, writings, the Summa Theologica, is still, still celebrated today and taught widely. Right, so but he he had been called to a different path, but it was certainly the Benedictines influenced indirectly his life. Okay, so this author I found on uh, Saint Thomas, he wrote about self mastery, which is self control. He says, by the discipline of self mastery or self control, the disciple follows Jesus in freedom, passing from pleasure to the. Uh, Seeking to seeking God. The disciple is freed by the delight of eternity and the triumph of everlasting life. So that's the benefit of following the fruits of the Spirit and avoiding the seven deadly sins, is that this brings us to, to see eternity. That's what we're trying to do. So St. Thomas was the one who taught, sent, section, uh, statement that I made earlier in a previous talk, says, the things that we love Tell us what we are. So St. Thomas knew that we become like what we love. If we embrace, set our hearts upon, and live for what passes and fails to satisfy, then we will become like what we loved, corruptible and disappointing. If instead we orient the appetites of the body and the powers of the soul upon the divine wisdom, then we become like what we love, eternal light and life. The true disciple of Christ, seeing that creation is good, including what delights the senses and the soul in this life, wisely and with grace, chooses to sacrifice for the good what is better. That's a principal focus of striving to live the fruits of the Spirit. We strive to sacrifice for the good, what is better? By following what the Lord's teaching through the fruits of the Spirit. So Christian self-control gives the disciple, that's each of us, clarity of vision and strength of character so as to not collapse under the weight of threats or the burden of disappointments or the corrosion of discouragement. Christian self-control also helps us to protect from the seduction and illusion and distraction and addiction that the world offers us both constantly and insistently. The world certainly offers us lots of alluring things, but we need to keep focused on the fruit of the Spirit, what leads us up to God. Rather than stifling a Christian's capacity for love and delight, self-control is a means for expanding and securing the human body and soul for pleasure love, and peace. And as I mentioned, if you look at the, uh, the, the fruits of the Spirit, is it starts with self-control. And somebody pointed out to me yesterday, that's the only one that doesn't have a spiritual element. It actually, it's uh, self-control starts not in the heart, but in, in, in the head. And that is making a decision. Okay, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow a Christian way. And then the Fruits of the Spirit build on that. So each of them builds up to love, which is the fullness of living in the Spirit. Right? But it starts with self-control. It starts with making a decision to follow Jesus. And in becoming oblates and being an oblate, you've made that decision. And now it's our job to help you to live it out, to live it well, to keep making that focused decision to practice self-control. 
Okay, then, so what I did toward the beginning of the retreat and I'll do toward the end of the, at the end of the retreat is to encourage you as you're preparing for Lent to focus on, again, moving from the seven deadly sins to the nine fruits of the Spirit. I'm going to invite you to read two chapters of the rule, chapter 4 and chapter 49. So chapter 49, the first, few, the first paragraph or so, focuses on preparing for Lent. Okay, so that's what we're preparing to do on the 22nd, that's Ash Wednesday. And then the tools for good works in chapter 4 give us lots of examples of ways to prepare for Lent. So the fruit of the Spirit, that's certainly one set. St. Benedict has a lot of different things that he calls us to do. So each of those helps us to practice self-control, helps us to live the fruit of the Spirit, and helps us to, to grow into the love, joy, and peace that God calls us to. So I hope that what I've said this weekend during this retreat has been helpful. I hope that it encourages you to live the fruit of the Spirit, avoid the seven deadly sins, and prepare well for Lent and life, and continue to live life well as a Benedictine Albright. Thank you. Amen.